We are live. Welcome to Avatar The Way of Water 3D Review and Thoughts. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I loved but had some issues with. This video will have some jokes and I will definitely get into some serious topics. In the far off year of 2009, an eternity ago, years before Thanos demonstrated, it was indeed worth the wait despite him just sitting on his big purple ass for the first three appearances. A few years after the X-Men trilogy fizzled out and right around with the Origins spin-off series proved to be dead on arrival. James Cameron released a movie directed by him for the first time in 12 freaking years, the longest wait between the release of any one of his theatrical fiction movies and the next, it would be no less than 13 years before he would release a sequel. And it is on this day that we can examine if it was worth the wait or not. And let's see. Yeah, so I still hold the original Avatar in very high regard. I don't love it quite as much as I did the first time I watched it. I realized some issues with it, and I will be going over the issues over the course of this video as I compare and see if this one fixes, or, or not fixes the issues, but if they did a better job in, in this one. So I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers. Let's see, Also, I will be including discussing the ending and throughout this video I will be spoiling the first movie. Now, the... So, the movie, yes, the movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video, and do note that, you know, if, if you're considering bringing kids to, to this, you know, they are now allowed at least one F word and several S words, so... Yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, no matter whether you know whether you love or hate the the Avatar movies or James Cameron's movies in general, I don't hate you. We are all entitled to our own opinion. Let's see. You know. It, if you if you find that your opinion simply differs from mine, you know, feel free to post in the comments. I will let you know why it's wrong. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm happy to debate these movies with you. Now, let's see. So, yeah, this is. Um, I kind of thought we were done with this, but we're not. Um, James Cameron's not, at least. This is this is a a sequel in the vein of Terminator 2, Home Alone 2, and just so many others. Um, in a number of ways, it is the same as the first in its series. It just changes, it tweaks some things and and goes bigger, but it's, yeah, it, I, I think, and, you know, I've, I've already seen a number of people really hating that about this movie, and I do think that it might be one of the biggest, like, you know, this, this is one of those movies, like, if you like the original, you there's there's a certain chance you'll like this one as well. If you didn't like the original, you might like this one, 
but for sure something that's going to be a hurdle for many people's enjoyment is the fact that it is just yeah it's it's it has way too many similarities to the first one i i would definitely say now i have watched this once and i watched it in 3d and i don't think this one was and 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 with the the high frame rate some of the time i'm not sure this was released in a regular frame rate at least it the when i when i booked my tickets it didn't offer an alternative to hfr high frame rate the way that the hobbit you know there you had to choose do you want to see it in high frame rate you know i i chose the the 3d i believe there are also 2d showings but yeah the let's see so the high frame rate and uh not imax but what is it called again Dol dolby surround or something i yeah and yeah, so the first movie I must have watched about half a dozen times by now. And that was one of the movies that I watched, like, three times within a very short... Like, right after it came out. I watched it multiple times. So, let's see. The... Yeah, that brings us to the plot. And, yeah, so basically, I don't know how much I want to give away. Um, yeah, the, the, the IMDb summary does a good job. Jake Sully lives with his newfound family formed on the planet of Pandora. Once a familiar threat returns to finish what was previously started, Jake must work with Neytiri and the army of the Navi race to protect their planet. And this is a spoiler, so I'm putting it in the spoiler section. There we go. There. Right, and it has been uh, years. I I don't think it's necessary. Like, you know, obviously this takes place after the events of the first one. It has been years. I don't think it's particularly necessary for me to say out loud how many. We all know how many years it was. Like, so let's let's move on. I no. I I honestly, this movie has way too much information for me to remember everything. Um, if I had to guess, maybe 15, 20 years or something like that, based on the ages. It seem, you know, yeah, the seeming ages of of some of these. Of the of the offspring, I don't know. I just find it kind of weird to call grown-up people children just because they happen to have parents, rather than I don't know being cloned. I guess. Now let's see. So this is one of those where part of the reason that I do this is that. It's connected to James Cameron, and, like, yeah, I'll, I'll get into my, my, actually, yeah, yeah, I have watched everything that he has written and or directed that isn't a documentary, because I am not particularly interested in documentaries. I'm especially not interested in documentaries made by people who normally make fiction movies I, I don't know how that became a thing like that just yeah anyway so the 3d yeah you know it is legitimately even better than the first avatar um yeah you know the 3d will add depth there are things that stick out at the audience the things that fly to do this right fly right at us at the, the yeah 
And yeah, it handles 3D underwater scenes even better than Aquaman and Black Panther 2. Now, right, so that brings us to the writing. So this was written by James Cameron and Josh Friedman. And there we go. So yeah, um... I think, yeah, so basically, I'll, I'll get into the writings of Cameron in, you know, just shortly, but Josh Friedman, a lot of what he's responsible for, I am not really familiar with, I think basically the only things, oh yeah, he did write the screenplay for The Black Dahlia, huh. Um, but, but yeah, um, he wrote the story for Terminator Dark Fate, and the, the screenplay for this was written by the two of them together, and he, let's see, he created and wrote, let's, let's see, yeah, he created the Terminator of the Sarah Connor Chronicles, and he remained showrunner for all 31 episodes, both seasons. And, um, let's see, then there was the thing with the... Yeah, and he's, he's personally, you know, he personally wrote some of, let's see, what does it say? Four episodes of the, the 31. Now... I don't love everything about Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles, but I love a lot of, perhaps most, things about it. I rewatched all the episodes that I love before going to see Avatar 2. I suppose I could just as easily have said that I just watched all the episodes. There's no distinction between those two for me. And, yeah, um, that show has incredibly original, smart writing full of depth. Avatar 1 could use more of that. Uh, this movie actually does have some really good... Yeah. Uh, maybe they should... Maybe Josh Friedman needs to be writing all of Cameron's movies from now on if he isn't gonna... Yeah. There's there's much more depth and character in, in this one compared to the first Avatar movie. Now... Let's see, so this is, um, yeah, so worst the best ranking James Cameron movies, and I, yeah, the documentaries are the only ones I haven't watched. So of the ones that he wrote and didn't direct, worst the best, Dark Fate, Rambo 2, Alita, Strange Days, I, I love Strange Days, and I certainly love a lot about Alita. And yeah, so the ones that Cameron has directed, you know, and he didn't write all of these. And yeah, these, all of them, right, all that he's directed other than this one, I will update the list with the placement of this one at the end of the review itself. So. If you want to go ahead and eat dessert before the, the meal, feel free to skip to right before I start the, the thoughts sections. Now, the... Yeah, so. Directed regardless of whether or not he's written them. Keeping in mind, I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. True Lies, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Titanic, Terminator 2... Aliens and Terminator 1. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, right off the bat, I want to make it absolutely clear. I agree with James Cameron that capitalism should not be allowed to destroy nature or infringe on the property, culture, and safety of indigenous people. And um, apparently some conservatives think this movie will be woke and that James Cameron will get on a soapbox. I would love for anyone to point me to one movie that he has written and or directed where, like, 
uh, uh, yeah, that d does not contain his progressive politics and him on the soapbox. Like that's that's a hilarious, you know. Some sometimes, uh, God bless him. Conservatives like conservative commentators. They're so certain that they got to figure it figured out, you know. They're just they're so convinced that they have the their finger on the pulse, and like literally, you can go all the way back. To, let's see, I get, the first one would be 1984's Terminator. You know, uh, let's see, it turns that that movie is 38 years old. I want to say that one is progressive and has him on a so like he is very like there are some very very clear messages to glean from that one so just yeah it's it's yeah now let's see and yeah i i would definitely say you know sometimes it does get annoying i'm i'm just saying you know, like, saying it as if it's some, like, amazing new revelation is ridiculous. But, but yeah, he does get preachy sometimes. And while I agree with a lot of the opinions that he espouses in these movies, yeah, I think it hurts the cause when he gets annoyingly preachy. I think it makes people not take it as seriously. I think this one did fairly decent but there definitely are some times where it is a bit much and yeah there's some there's some interesting sci-fi concepts in this and honestly i i wish i can't really talk about that one without spoiling so i'll write uh, let's see, here we go. Yeah, so, in Aliens, Cameron has Sigourney Weaver, the returning protagonist, explain the important details about the Xenomorph that we learned in the first movie, and Josh Friedman made sure that the pilot for Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles had characters reiterate everything vital to know about the first two Terminator movies, keeping in mind it ignores the third one. I mean, I guess technically it skips past the third one, and it was made before the, the fourth, and yeah. And let's see. So, so yeah, you know, that brings up the question, does Avatar 2 also have, you know, on the one hand, it is a big ask. Not only should you watch this three-hour movie, you should also watch that other three-hour movie first. And, you know, depending on where in the world you are, tell Carmen Sandiego that people miss her. But, yes, in some countries, it is on Disney Plus now. You know, they did take it off temporarily so that they could make some more money by put it, putting it in theaters. Now, let's see. You know, on the other hand, most people... Uh, let's see. Most people who care about Avatar 2 have watched the first one at least once before, and it's a lot easier to rewatch a movie today than it was in 1986 when Aliens came out. These things are also true of the Sarah Connor Chronicles. But yeah, um, you don't have to watch the entire movie. There, there's, you know. Um, I guess, I think I'll put at least one link in the description box. You know, some, yeah, some people have put out, 
um, yeah, videos that are supposed to bring you, you know, remind you of everything that happened in the first one without having to watch the entire, uh, I think this one will do nicely. Um, so let's see, here we go. There. So, but, but yeah, you know, if, if you are, you know, if you want to and you have easy access to it, yes, you know, it is worth rewatching Avatar 1 before watching Avatar 2. You know, it does, Avatar 2 does bring up some of the major events and, and characters and such, but it's not necessarily to remind the audience as much as it's because there's something new that relates to that. So, you know, someone brings up, hey, remember how this, that, and the other thing happened in the first movie? Well, we think that's why this thing, you know. Yeah, this is actually... If someone... If someone tries watching this movie without knowing anything about the first one, please post your experience in the comments, because that... That must be trippy. So, let's see. Yeah, in a lot of ways, the writing is better here. And, yeah, one of the big problems for the first movie is that the, stores, the story and characters hold very few surprises. Like, once you've met the major characters, which is somewhere around the 40 to 60 minute mark, depending on who you want to include, into this 156 without credits movie, you can guess every major plot point, except maybe the death of Grace, which ultimately changes nothing, especially now that the actress is back anyway. Like, I, I remember watching it the first time, and I wasn't, like, shocked and dismayed. I was like, oh, I'm kind of I'm kind of going to miss her character. She was fun, you know. Sigourney's, when is Sigourney Weaver ever not, like, compelling to watch, you know, but... Yeah, you know, he found a way to bring Sigourney Weaver back. So, yeah, it's... Now, let's see. And and I find it odd because all other movies written and or directed by James Cameron hold at least some major twists that make the movie better. And, yeah, there are definitely there are things in this movie that I did not at all see coming and that made a huge difference. So, yeah. So, as a feminist, I'm really glad there are feminist themes in most James Cameron movies. There are some in this, but ultimately not, like... <sighs> there, there are a couple of parts where you have these really annoying, like... I get it. James Cameron... Let's see... He was born in 1954. The world was a very different place when he was young than it is today. I understand that it is difficult to, you know, change with the, with the times. But if you're gonna make movies, you, you kind of gotta, you know, or people are not gonna respond particularly well to it and there are several parts in this where it is this strange like it almost feels like <sighs> yeah i mean some some people do get more conservative as they get older and yeah he maybe was more of a progressive in some ways at least in his younger days now let's see. Um, okay, so the right, so James Cameron 
said that part of the reason that the Yeah, uh, it was important to James Cameron that, you know, the the movie works, like, it, there's, there's the surface level, the thematic level, but also the third level, the subconscious level, and, yeah, I mean, apparently he felt that the first movie made it to the subconscious level, I, I don't, I wouldn't quite agree with that, but I do think this one does. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and, the, the, yeah. Cameron said that he didn't want to hear anybody's new pitches, anybody's new ideas. The direct quote, until we've spent some time figuring out what worked in the first movie, what connected, and why it worked. They kept wanting to talk about the new stories. I said, we're not going to do that yet. Eventually, I had to threaten to fire them all because they were doing what writers do, which is trying to create new stories. And, yeah, I... I really, really hope that the third movie takes... A, a different than 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 just another retelling of but yeah the movie handles plot twists fairly well now yeah so moving on to direction so let's see Right, I um, I realized when I looked up, you know, not not that I didn't remember all the movies that he has directed, but just you know, I I always just just as a as a habit, I always copy in the the titles, you know, that someone has in this case directed. Turns out he actually directed a music video for the band Martini Ranch. The the song and music video is called Reach. And, you know, if you watch it today, it is a, it is a slightly bittersweet experience. Because the, the band was... The... the I want to say lead singer is the title of, of the band is, was the, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, I'll have it in a few seconds. Uh, there we go. And his name, Bill Paxton, who passed away. But yeah. Um, it's a, it's a great song, it's a great music video, yeah, um, it's on you, it's right here on YouTube, at least, I'll, I'll double check, but, Martini Ranch Reach, yeah, in, uh, pretty decent quality, it's not, like, unwatchable, but, you know, the music video was directed in 1988, so, and and it's not like a movie so they don't have like a great print of it anymore but yeah it's it's fun it's a uh, it's worth watching let's see and and yeah you know the moment that i even heard oh bill paxton used to have a band like the moment that the music starts you're like yeah that is 100% the kind of music that bill paxton would make and yeah it was it was really great so let's see uh, hmm. 
so yeah um you know the the yeah the 3d is great here i do think you know it's not it's not necessarily going to be as spectacular for for people this time since you know we've now had 13 years of 3d movies you know and and a number of them have done really really well you know um some of the mcu movies use 3d incredibly well um especially like the very biggest of the of the titles so it's been a while and i only did watch them once in theaters but i believe infinity war and um uh endgame both had excellent 3d um was there maybe also right and and i you know yeah i'm not gonna get into the movie here but the uh ridley scott the one that wasn't called alien but was an alien movie uh, Pr prometheus that one had really s strong 3d um some of the 3d in the second Sin City movie was amazing. Yeah, you know, the... Um, I... The, the water stuff is very, very good, but I don't think it's as... Yeah. Let's see. So, yeah, the, the first movie had to cover a lot of time and development, with montages and narration, so it felt like it should have been a miniseries. And yeah, now that the first movie got a lot of world building out of the way, this does feel more like it should be a movie. It still has some pacing issues for sure. And and I really like there's still narration from Jake, and I, I get it, like I some of this stuff I don't know how to get it across without narration. But I really have no idea who he's even talking to at this point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe it'll be revealed in one of the sequels. I, I could really respect Cameron if he just threw in, like, a joke explanation. Like, you know, eventually it turns out that Jake was just explaining all this to you know some some poor guy who came in to to fix the toilet and jake is just he just needs to get this off his chest so he's just been you know tormenting this poor guy with the life his whole life story you know or, or some kind of just patience sometimes it can make you feel wonder why you waited so long for such a letdown how many more of these? That I I could really respect that. That would be yes. But but yeah, um, you know there are some of these same things with you know people learning things and such, and some of the time it's still montage and and such. But I felt like there were times at least where it was more. Yeah, it felt more like a movie. It it um, it flowed naturally. It felt like scenes rather than montage. Now, let's see. Yeah, and since this movie, you know, this movie doesn't redefine what avatars are in this movie's universe, so... Yeah, it's not a big surprise that this movie is not as much about avatars as it is about Navi. I really feel like the first movie should have been called Navi or Pandora, something that appears in the sequels rather than just, you know, I don't know, I guess it's possible one of the sequels will also really, really be about avatars, but I kind of doubt it. It really seems like, no, from, you know, now it really is about the Navi. So, yeah, something like Pandora, which is the planet, since so far both movies take place on the same planet. Now, and 
yeah, the way of water, because Cameron can't get enough stories dealing with sailing, swimming, underwater races, and such. There is an actual explanation for both the, the, uh, the, yeah, water being so important to the movie, and that specific phrase, the way of water. Now, so, yeah, Cameron clearly believes women can be strong too, not always physical strength and weapons prowess, but strong in useful ways, and I wish there was more of that in this one, but there is some. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but I'll just say that at least one major female character in this helps in a way that is traditionally viewed as feminine rather than masculine. Uh, so I'm just really quickly going to write it, so I'll talk about it in the second thoughts section. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, that brings us, uh, and Cameron has empathy for regular people, blue collar workers, not corporations. Who also don't have empathy for regular people and blue collar workers and yeah you do see that some here there there are some regular people that are affected in a really awful way you know they've they've done nothing wrong but they're still being abused so yeah i i quite appreciate that that actually you know this movie has a bunch of like the first one, there are some very clear allusions to the um, the Vietnam War, which, you know, what is it, 45 years since that ended, and I think they should keep making these movies until America has a proper, <sighs> properly processes what it was, and admits... You know, it, it has to become something that the, you know, the regular American looks back on and says, you know what, we did some, you know, some really monstrous things were done by U.S. troops in Vietnam. And, yeah, you know, I, so yeah, you know, Cameron was born in 54, so he was a young man when the Vietnam War happened, and clearly it got, it, it really bothered him understandably so and yeah you know so let's see there's two avatars and the movie aliens i'm not sh it's possible some of the others also have like the terminator movies is more cold war than vietnam uh but but yeah you know so clearly he does you know he he wants for people to, to empathize with the, the regular people caught in that conflict. Now, right, so in Terminator 2 and Aliens, the first two sequels and second in a movie series that Cameron wrote and directed, two people working for a giant corporation will note that it's useless to ask upstairs questions about details because the answer is always, don't ask. He did not go for the trifecta. I, I wish he had. That would have been really great. And there are a couple of times where that could have... You could have fit that in. So it's it's too bad. I don't know if he didn't think of it or maybe it was eventually cut because it just didn't work tone-wise. Not that that stopped him all the time. But anyway, let's see... Yeah, so, you know, Cameron tends to spell out ideas, messages, and concepts in his movies. And he does try to give reasons for why it's being spelled out, like a character is having it explained to them, and it's necessary, but... 
yeah, you know, it, it really... I hope that in one of these sequels he explains who is Jake talking to at this point, you know, and... Because, cause yeah, you know, there are times where there's narration and it's really just because it is the fastest way to get these some of these details across. And... So, so yeah, you know, Terminator 2 doesn't change much plot-wise from the first film, but Aliens does. And, yeah, in, in that regard, this one is closer to Terminator 2. You know, bigger, in some ways deeper, but very, very similar plot. And, yeah, this has three times as many characters and is half an hour longer and there's definitely some bloat going on. And, you know, some people will be really... I, I thought that it was going to, uh, you know... Let's see... Right, and according to Zoe Saldana in an interview, it took them five years to shoot this. And... Yeah, so I want to make it clear, I don't have a problem with long movies. I prefer the extended cut Lord of the Rings movies to the theatrical ones. However, before watching this movie, James Cameron had not proven to me that it was necessary for him to make movies that are longer than two hours. Every movie before this one that he he's made that goes on that goes above two hours, I think has stuff that could easily be trimmed out. And yeah, ultimately. I, I stand by, I don't think this needed to be longer than two hours. Especially considering that, like, when you get to the end, it doesn't feel like a complete... Like, it's not called part one, but it almost might as well be. There, there are some really important things that are not resolved by the end of this. And, you know, if that's what you're gonna do, like, at least make it shorter so it's not so bloated there's th this could easily have been made into a to a not editing wise the way it is now but you know they should have kept trimming the script down and let's see yeah avatar one is one of those movies i wish i could give other examples but obviously they'll spoil where the climax has so much and such amazing action that I end up kind of annoyed that the entire movie wasn't like that. I don't need every movie to have action scenes at all. But if you end with something really big, then I leave just wondering, why didn't you split up that big thing and have action at the start, the middle, and at the end, not only at the end. And yeah, this movie fares a lot better. Like, there's some pretty big action very, very early on. And, you know... Yeah, also around the middle and then, you know, the, the climax. So, let's see. The... Um, so, in an interview with, you know, someone... Cameron stated, I don't want anybody whining about length when they sit and binge watch television for eight hours. I've watched my kids sit and do five one-hour television episodes in a row. Here's the big social paradigm shift that has to happen. It's okay to get up and go pee. There's a huge difference between binging in your own home where you can pause to a cinema full of people where you cannot pause. This, you know, that's... That that quote like has real energy of like LA person who doesn't understand regular people. Um, that yeah, dude. I get you know obviously he he himself he's writing, directing, and editing the movie, so he's happy with how it ends up. What about like there? Some of the things that happen in this movie. Are really gonna make you wish that it was significantly shorter so that we had time to process you know after watching instead of you know like yeah some things happen in this movie and then like 
two hours pass before the end credits start rolling and it's like I barely even remember what was it that I was that really gripped me and I was hoping that I would have time to process like just yeah now uh, let's see so the Yeah, so some critics didn't like the first and didn't like this one. And yeah, you know, uh, right, so some critic quotes. It's one or more blue people learning culture of other blue people. The movie is made in part because Cameron has five kids and has been a parent of teenagers. So it's for teenagers and parents of teenagers. I honestly did not think that I would be able to relate to that at all. Um, I don't have kids. I did earlier today think about that I'm old enough that if, like, if I had kids when I was young, and at least one of the kids that I had also had a kid when he was young, I could be a grandfather by now, which is just... Holy crap. But anyway... Um, of an of an infant, the the my grandson or daughter, I, you know, either or or non-binary, would have to be an infant. But nevertheless, yes, I am I am old enough that that wow. But anyway, um, yeah, I I I ha I struggle to relate to to parents. I probably always will. But yeah, for sure, some of the the teenagers I could really relate to. And let's see, yeah, um, right. So one critic said in the first movie, I was bored whenever we had to watch Jake the Human. I want to see more of Jake the Blue Man. This time, it's all blue people. You really hate the vi villains. You want to see them pay, same as in the first one. That's very true. Like you really. <sighs> I'll I'll grant like there's sometimes he'll do you know James Cameron will sometimes write and direct stuff in a way that I find very frustrating but the man knows how to make us just despise some like like the the people that yeah he's really really good at at crafting villains that we just just hate and just want to see it's just yeah there's not enough plot for three hours the world building feels like a documentary coming of age story with peer pressure bullying and tough love the message is save the whales the second act is bad in the middle section, I was wondering why they were getting into all these different plots, but the last hour of the movie is excellent, full of action, and uses all the plots set up. The last hour is either amazing or exhausting, depending on the viewer. Let's see. One action scene starts by flying in the air and then goes underwater. Now, me personally, I love HFR high frame rate, I think it was excellent on the Hobbit trilogy, and those movies, you know, there are things about them that I acknowledge, I mean, that could have been better, but yeah, you know, in my personal experience, and the experience of the, the people I talk to, within 15 to 30 minutes, your eyes will adjust, and the rest of the time, it looks and feels better than normal frame rate. Now, in this movie, it will sometimes change, you know, switch between... I don't know if it's 48 frames or if it's 60 frames, but yeah, you know, high frame rate back to a normal frame rate, the, the 24 frames per second. And yeah, it especially does this in action scenes. And, you know, some people have said it has the feel of a soap opera. It has the feel of a video game. And, you know, some, some people felt, you know, for, for some people, they were, you know, they were pulled out of the movie by that and other things i definitely right right because it was so noticeable when it would switch between frame rates i 
I noticed it a number of times. It didn't really pull me out of it. I do. I I would say that my. Yeah, it's it's. I hope that. I I had a better experience. With the high frame rate, in the Hobbit trilogy. So I hope that's what catches on rather than this switching back and forth. But, yeah. Um, a lot of generic dialogue. Info overload at start. They could have trimmed it down. So, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I th I like the ending of the movie. I I don't I wouldn't say I necessarily love it, but at the end of the day, it's just part of the problem is that it's if the ending of this movie resolved more of the conflicts, I would have a better idea of if I like it or not but as it is I kind of have to wait for some of the other sequels to f take care of those conflicts and hopefully not raise too many new ones but as it is yeah like I I I hate to say it but in some ways this feels like a really really big pilot episode and and that just should not be the case when it's the, like I realize we're getting more of these but I don't think this one I, th I think it would have made more sense to have fewer subplots fewer characters and just properly resolve the ones that are, are set up and make a much shorter movie and just make sure that people want more of this because I'm not gonna you know it's it's at this point become a cliche to to joke that uh, nobody wants more Avatar and the movies are never gonna be released and we're getting 10 of them and and all this stuff but like you, you kind of gotta make sure like the, these cost several hundreds of millions of dollars to make. You really have to make sure that there's sufficient interest that it's going to make. Like, yeah, if, you know, the, the Terminator movies used to rake in a lot of money. And then gradually, you know, they they struggled to, you know, put put out movies that enough people wanted to watch. But yeah, the, let's see, uh, right, so, regarding the ending, it's been too long since I watched The Abyss for me to remember about that one, but other than that, I love the endings to all of his movies, and he's responsible, responsible for some of the best action movie climax scenes, both the Terminator, both of the real Terminator movies and Aliens, and his action movie climax scenes are always incredible, and that is the case here. There's definitely some kind of awkward stuff where it feels like some of the time in this movie, he will contrive, you know, the, the, this was also an issue in, in the first Avatar, he will, he will want a very specific scene, so he'll contrive the scenario to where that's, you know, he gets what he wants, but he used to be much better at making them more organic, and just, yeah, I think actually, yeah, uh, uh, I would argue a good example is the first Terminator and the movie Aliens. In both of those, he really manages to make things comfortably and smoothly transition into things that where to where he can comment on certain things and it doesn't feel awkward and in this movie there's stuff where it's like i mean okay i guess it, it, it like ideally when you watch a movie you shouldn't be able to pinpoint okay this is what they actually wanted to do and they basically wrote everything else around that like we know that's 
partially true of the first Terminator, but that's because James Cameron has been forthcoming with that information. He's he's opened up about opened up about it in interviews. You know, if you don't I, I would argue that if if you don't know what the first Terminator movie builds up to, if you haven't heard it from someone, I don't think you'll necessarily be able to tell. I would argue that the rest of the movie is crafted so carefully that it doesn't feel like he was just going out of his way to reach that one particular point. But ultimately, it's I, I don't know how to test someone for for that but yeah and and don't worry i i will not be giving away the the endings of his other movies in this video I, again unless i verbally warn before i do so hold up an index finger now this apparently does not have a post credits according to google and honestly after such a long movie i was pretty happy about that so, that brings us to the characters. So, Sam Worthington returns as Jake Sully. And, let's see. the Yeah, so one critic said, I get that there's supposed to be more than one dimension to Jake, and there is in the script, but the acting is not good enough to bring that forth. And yeah, I, I would also... I, I actually... I sat waiting for um, for the other shoe to drop, for us to finally get that extra dimension to Jake, and it just never really happened. Like maybe it's maybe we're gonna get there in some of the other sequels, but considering like I I don't know that I would say he's necessarily still the protagonist of this. There's basically there's multiple protagonists really, so you know. Like, uh, when when you have so many characters, you know, it it can be, it's, it's a bit easier to understand why some, you know, why, why they might struggle to give everyone, you know, character development. But he has so much screen time, I really felt like it would have made sense for there to be more to him. Actually, there was this part very close to the end where I thought... Oh, they're gonna... Oh, no. Fair enough. They're not going there at all. They're just... They're they're doing the other thing, which... It's a choice. And Zoe Zaldana... Saldana returns as Neytiri, and... You know, yeah, she's great. Still, um... And Sigourney Weaver plays Kiri, Jake and Natiri's adoptive teenage daughter. So you might remember that Weaver played Dr. Grace Augustine in the first movie, but she died and Cameron liked, you know, Cameron liked working with Sigourney Weaver and likes the work of Sigourney Weaver. I don't blame him. He's only human. And she wanted to work on more James Cameron movies. Which, again, like... I, I can think of quite a few people who would love to work on even one James Cameron movie. Let alone multiple, you know... But it is very awkward that she's, you know, yeah, she's portraying a teenager de-aged by technology, which might be the single most expensive way I've ever heard of someone saying that you don't think there are any good teenage actors who can pass for Sigourney Weaver. The, the, um, yeah, so Grace Augustine Every single, nearly every single line that she has in the first movie is immensely quotable. And 
there's a lot of lines by I already forgot her character name again, Kiri. Um Yeah, the the I'm not the first person to point out you know, so yeah, some other critics have already pointed out her voice, Sigourney Weaver's voice does not fit a teenage character. And it's just I mean, why on earth would it? I I don't yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day technology will allow us to shift the pitch of voices to make them sound, for example, younger than they are. Oh wait, it does exist. I had a cassette player that could do that over 25 years ago. Like, I don't even know that... Honestly, you can probably, like, just within a... Within minutes, Google and find a, a voice, you know, manipulating program that can make you sound younger. So I, I have no idea why they didn't do it. And Stephen Lang played Colonel Miles Quaritch in the, the first movie. And basically, I don't think I want to get into exactly what but the um yeah the, there's a there is a thing about you know he's he's not just mysteriously back somehow palpatine returned he there there is technically an an explanation now, uh, one critic said he's just not a particularly interesting antagonist here. He's just another stepping stone to the third movie. Cliff Curtis plays Tonowari, the leader of the Reef People clan of Metkayina. He's great, and that's, you know, yeah. I, I, I've... I'll, I'll check real quick, but I'm almost certain I've never seen Cliff Curtis do a bad job. Let's see. Yeah, and he is of New Zealand Maori descent. And I am... Yeah, they even have which tribal affiliations on, on IMDb. I am not going to butcher the... The name, yeah, that's right. Once were warriors. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Um, training day, sunshine. Ah, yeah, he's he's amazing. I I don't think that indigenous people should only get to. Oh, hey, he's in Colombiana, just like Zoe is. Anyway, uh, I don't think that only the, the, ah, what's the word? If you are of indigenous, uh, you know, if, yeah, um, if you are a descendant of indigenous people, I don't think you should only get to play indigenous you know but i do really appreciate when they they cast indigenous characters as using actors who actually do have that background so now let's see Um, yeah, Kate Winslet plays Ronal, and I am not 100 versus, there's too many characters in this freaking thing. Um, I think I maybe know who she's playing, but I'm honestly not sure. And... Let's see, so the, um, 
I think I am just Yeah, you know, they, they did cast at least some non-white people in major Navi roles. Uh, let's see. Yeah, um... Let's see the... Yeah, Britton Dalton plays Loak, Jake and Natiri's second son. I felt like he was very relatable. I, I feel like this is a movie where everyone is going to relate to at least one major character. I, I would be very surprised to, to hear... Okay, put it in the comments, please. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested. I, th I think most people will find, and, and, you know, you're not wrong if that didn't happen. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, hearing why, if, if you, yeah, if you, if you'd be interested in going into why, I, I think most people will find at least one major character in this that they really relate to, not necessarily as a, it, you know, it's a it's a fantastical story, so obviously not the exact same experiences, but some of the some of some of the way that they are maybe seen, or the way that they behave around other people. You know, yeah. And let's see. Um, so, let's see, right, Jermaine Clement is in this, which, yeah, that's, that's interesting, I, I wish they allowed him to be funnier, because it, like, J Jermaine Clement not being funny, that's like, I, I don't, I'm not sure I've even seen that before, like, he is always really, really funny, so, but, but, yeah, um, he's, he, it's, I, I like seeing him, nevertheless. Uh, let's see. Um... Okay, I'm not entirely sure. Y yeah, I think it... Uh, let's see. Edie Falco as General Ardmore, the commander in charge of the RDA's interests, was also quite uh, compelling. Now, uh, yeah, so some critics say, you know, it's, it's very hit and miss cast. The younger cast are much better than the, you know, older... Certainly some of them are, yeah. The relationships between, relationship dynamics between the teen characters is one of the highlights of the film. All the major characters get their own Oscar moment. And that brings us to the dialogue. So there's definitely, like... There's some there's some elements in the dialogue that work quite well. Um, I wish there was less generic dialogue, but there's definitely some like there's this thing of how um, a number of the the younger characters will refer to each other as bro as a. Uh, Ah, uh, what's the word? Like, um, sort of, you know, yeah, in a, in a, in a positive way, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those words that, like, if you hear someone, like, let's say you're, you're not completely, like, you've had a little bit too much to drink, you're not 100%, and you hear someone just use the word bro, you can't be certain 
if they are like angry, like, what's your problem, bro? Or if they're like, ah, bro, nice to see you. So, you know, but yeah, in this case, in this movie, it does, it tends to be, ah, bro, nice to see you. And yeah, I, I kind of felt like that worked. And there's this, there's one character that is kind of, sort of, a little further, um, yeah, I, I, you know, that's a, maybe a little bit further out. And I, I'm not sure... No, I think sometimes they do call him bro, and other times they call him cousin. Like, he's maybe not part of the immediate family, but he's related. I I thought that was quite a good... And, you know, I... I don't know how Cameron managed it, but, but yeah. Like, he still, he really has a knack for writing these... You know, at times kind of ridiculous, but really, like, you just kind of, yeah. These these southern military stereotypes where, you know, in, in aliens, you're not necessarily, like, really hating them. Although, you know, maybe really early in that movie. But in, in this and the first Avatar, you do really hate them. And, yeah, they, they do a really good job. And there's actually some of them that you really, you hate their guts and they're not even necessarily saying anything. Like some of the, you know, Quaritch and some of the other military people, like there's these people who have like shades on and there's this, you know, one of them is like, uh, what, what's the word again? Like, they've, you know, blowing bubblegum bubbles, I think it's referred to as. And it's just like, and, and they're, you know, Chewing bubble gum and then blowing a bubble and you know breaking the bubble and chewing some more while this really awful stuff is being done right around like they don't even care you know and it just it really makes you hate like I couldn't tell you I'm not I think some of them might not even have had a speaking line but just the sunglasses and the bubble gum you know just yeah. So the cinematography was handled by Russell Carpenter. And let's see. Yeah, he's listed as also the cinematographer for the third one since they shot them back to back. And right. So, yeah, the first Ant-Man, which does have some very interesting uh, photography because some of the stuff. You know, to to get across this thing of, you know, this, you know, yeah, the, the titular character shrinks to the size of an ant. And let me think, they, they used, like, real photographs to make, you know, and, and CG to make these massive sets that he would be ant-sized in. And... Yeah, they, they did a really incredible job there. And, and he was definitely part of that as director of photography. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, someone had to shoot This Means War, The Ugly Truth, Monster in Law, Shallow Hal, the Charlie's Angels, the 2000s Charlie's Angels movies. Oh, Titanic, True Lies, um, yeah, so he, you know, he has worked with Cameron before, um, let's see, Lawnmower Man, to be fair, some of that movie is very, very visually, Although I suppose that's maybe more special effects than than cinematography, but anyway. But but yeah, Titanic also has some really really strong uh, uh, cinematography. And that brings us to the editing and um, hmm. Yeah, this is one of those where there's a short list of 
Okay, so some of it was apparently done by... Wait, is that right? I, I gotta double check this. That seems... Um, okay, um, yeah, so, um, among the editors is David Brenner, R.I.P., and... Right, so yeah, he also did both cuts of Justice League, both cuts of Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, 302, Wall Street, uh, I guess only the, the new Wall Street one, the 2010 one, Wanted, 2012, Day After Tomorrow, and let's see, yeah, and James Cameron was one of the editors, it's, uh, not, not everybody, this, this, not everybody knows the following, but it actually, if you want to prevent James Cameron from if you know if you want to keep him out of the editing room there's actually a very detailed spell that you have to cast over every single possible entrance to the editing bay itself and it was also edited by John Rafua and Stephen E right Stephen E Rivkin and Ian Silverstein and i mean considering how vast the movie is i can see how they need multiple now. And and certainly there's some really excellent editing here. I would definitely say that they should have trimmed it down. Um, let's see. So yeah, apparently the the budget for this was two hundred and fifty million dollars, and other than like, um, yeah, some of this was filmed in New Zealand. Um, or wait, is that a studio? And so, yeah, the, the action is really, really well done. Um, I can understand why some people felt that sometimes it gets too big or goes on for too long or there's too little breathing room in between action scenes. I didn't feel that way, but, you know, like comparatively, I definitely felt exhausted at times during Black Adam, especially some of the really early action where it's like we've barely even gotten adjusted to, to the world that you've presented us with and you're already throwing this much action our way before we can really like it it's action has the potential to be meaningless if the context isn't clear enough and doesn't resonate enough with the audience and I felt that some of the first action scenes in that movie took place before, like, <sighs> yeah, some, some of the things that, some of the things that later became clear hadn't been, you know, made sufficiently clear yet. Um, and, and that wasn't the, the case here. Like, there's some really early action, but it's involving people and entities you already know. So, it's not... You're, you're not struggling to, to keep up or become invested. Um, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, fights, chases... There's vehicles, you know, sometimes it's in the air, sometimes it's on the water surface, sometimes it's 
under the surface of the water. Um, there's shooting, there's explosions, there's creatures, you know, just, yeah. Um, that brings us to the score. So this was handled by Simon Franklin, who has, right, <laughs> he's listed as composer on Avatars 2 through 5. He also did Friday... The 2016 Magnificent Seven, Peppermint, The Curse of Turandot, Notre Dame, On Fire, and yeah, other than that, like, he has way more, so, so yeah, nine credits total, but, you know, three of the movies aren't out yet, and other than that, he has 44 credits as Music Department. But, yeah, I think he did a great job here. Um, I don't know. Oh, that's right. Originally, it was going to be James Horner. And, you know, he, he also passed R.I.P. Um, there are several, like, horror movie music things. I really appreciated that. That, like, I, I felt like... We're, Okay, so, like, I guess I'm watching a, an old-school James Cameron. Like, this is, this is like, some Terminator aliens kind of... I'm digging it. I, I... That was... Yeah. That was really, really great. And something I really appreciate, especially about it, is that several of them were when, like... I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and call them Sky People, because I don't think any good guy in this movie ever refers to them as human the sky people who come to pandora from planet earth you know yeah on several there, there are several times where they will make like a dramatic entrance and the music won't be like uh oh it'll be like boo and i really that was yeah um that was really, really great. I, I, I dug that really so, so hard. Uh, the sound design is excellent. Not a surprise James for a James Cameron movie, but it bears repeating. It really, like, you have so many things in this movie that either don't make much sound in real life because it's underwater and it's like we're not, like... Human beings, our, our ears aren't really made for sticking our head underwater and being able to hear something that makes a certain noise from, from far away underwater. You know, that's, that is some of it. And then there's, like, technology that doesn't exist in the real world and, and various things. So, yeah. Now, um... Yeah, so the movie definitely has at least a little too many, a, li a little too much of, like, references to the first. Like, uh, Quaritch, there's this early scene where he basically, like, part of what he says, like, it, it's, I, I'm not sure it's word for word, but it is so similar to a speech he gave in the first Avatar, and it's just like, I mean... It's not really necessary. Like, we already, you know, he's he's a he's a fun antagonist. He's, you know, we we um, he's a character we love to hate. You don't have to like work extremely hard at making sure that we recognize him as just yeah. So, uh, let's see. So, so yes, the, I, I already talked about pacing issues. The movie without end credits is three hours and five minutes. And I would definitely say it is at least an hour too long. Let's see. Yeah, I'd say maybe an hour and 20 minutes too long overall. And again, especially because, like, there's a bunch of stuff that this movie sets up 
that, I mean, maybe it'll be resolved in some of the next movies. Like, can we just... Can someone please tell James Cameron that it's okay if he wants to make, like, a TV series or a miniseries? Because it really feels like... Like, I, I get it, you know, uh, he has a lot of ideas, but it's just, it's kind of awkward when he's so busy, like, I think it would have been much more compelling if these two Avatar movies had been two seasons of, like, miniseries or so, or, uh, let's see, wait, I guess not miniseries, then, a, a limited series or whatever, I, I forget. But yeah, like, uh, not, not like 22 episodes of either 20, let's see, 21 minutes or 42 minutes. But like, yeah, just split these three hour movies into maybe five or six episodes and focus the episodes instead of having material for six episode miniseries jammed into one movie that you have to watch in a single sitting so that like you could easily make just an entire episode that basically isn't anything other than us that other than world building you know just a lot of us seeing what certain creatures and certain places are like instead of constantly having to go between which, again, I felt was a bigger problem in the first than, than in this. So, let's see. The, let's see. The best element of this movie was probably the, the yeah, the, the themes it explores. Ah, uh, let's see. So the worst aspect is probably the the bloat. I'm not sure there's enough offered here to make up for such a long wait. And the idea that he's going to keep making... Like... I, I guess I'll keep watching because I really, really love James Cameron's work. But if the next movie doesn't significantly differ from these first two... This is going to be kind of a slog. Like, if, if he, every other year, he's going to put out yet another movie that's very, very similar to the ones that came before it, with some significant changes, just, yeah. Um, let's see. So, yeah. Uh, worst thing, according to others, is definitely bloat. The thing I was most worried about was that there would be a lot of outdated problematic tropes, and there definitely are some. I'll get into them in the in the thoughts sections. Um, let's see. And the thing I was most looking forward to was James Cameron directing again, and yeah. Like, he still really, really knows. It's, it's, there are definitely issues here, but he's still tremendously impressive. The trailers give at least a little too much away, but also give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. And the trailers are definitely worth watching. Okay. Let's see, and the, the cover and poster don't give too much away, but do give you an okay idea of what the movie is like. So, the on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 81%, which makes it certified fresh. So yeah, 160 critic reviews, 130 of them fresh. It was actually only, you know, fresh, not certified fresh earlier today. So it has gotten a, a boost since then. And, oh, right, right. Uh, let's see. So the average rating was 7.20 out of 
10. No audience score yet. And on Metacritic, it has a 69, nice, out of 100 based on 49 critic reviews. And 36 of them are positive, 11 are mixed, and 2 are outright negative. And, yeah, the, the two negative ones, I'll just very quickly read the quote. Avatar The Way of Water is a one-hour story rattling around in a 192-minute bag. And the other is, for all its world-building sprawl, the world of bleh, way of water is a rise and narrowing experience. The sad side of a great filmmaker reversing of a creative cul-de-sac. wonder if he kisses his mother with that mouth. And yeah, so on IMDb, it has an 8.3 out of 10. 2,123 IMDb users. And... 48.6% gave it 10, 14.8 gave it 9, 14.8 gave it 8, 6.7 gave it 7, 6.4 gave it 1. I mean, a 1, really? There's not a single thing you liked. In the entire movie, that brought it above a one. Keep keeping in mind on IMDb, you can't vote zero. If you give it, you know, if if you let your vote be heard, it has to be a one or above. It can't go. It you can't vote zero. And let's see, one point eight give it five. One point two give it three. Zero point nine give it four. Zero point seven give it two. And let's see. Yeah, so the 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 special effects always look really, really polished. So you know, some people will probably d dislike it going back and forth between frame rates. Uh, you know, I noticed it, but it wasn't something that bothered me. But that is definitely something. You know, if, if that's the kind of thing that's going to bother you, it might really bother you in this movie. Um, there's some really great stunt work. Uh, ultimately, it's kind of difficult to know with absolute certainty because, uh, you know, there's so much animation in, in this movie. But from what I could tell, some of it was actually, you know, they actually had people doing these ridiculous things that, yeah... Uh, let's see. That brings us to the rating. So, yeah, ultimately, um, eight sequels strongly resembling the first entry out of 10. And yeah, so let's see, where do I rank it among the other? Yeah, so best. <laughs> Worst to best of all of the movies that James Cameron has directed. Keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Worst to best, True Lies, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1. So I am just really quick going to make sure. There we go. And, uh, what was that? Okay. I do not know why it keeps bringing that thing up, but it doesn't seem to have any negative effect, so that's fine, I guess. 
There we go. And uh, yeah, it's still going, still going. So that brings us to the thoughts sections. Notes taken while watching. So I actually did manage to get all the way through one of these one of these pads. Even had to write a little bit on the on the back. Hasn't happened since Endgame. So, and I think on that one it was two entire pads. So, you know that still stands. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, we open the Hallelujah Mountains and Yeah, and we're explained about the the um what's it called? The the beads that that tell the the life story, you know, and they, yeah, so there's a bead for the birth of their son, Simba. I mean, ah, uh, you know what, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it correctly. I think it starts with an M or an N or something like that. And, let's see. Yeah, um... Okay, so, very early on, Jake says that early on he struggled to speak um, the Navi language, and now it base it's as natural to him as English, and then they just speak English. I figure it's probably because I'm not 100% certain how, you know, yeah, some, some of the actors here are on the young side. I didn't carbon date them. And they didn't want, like, you know, James, James, well, James Cameron himself, maybe he does tend to push his actors. But someone sensible said you're going to have these kids mocap free dive and act simultaneously maybe maybe they shouldn't also have to speak this language that was invented for these films like it would at least be something like let's say that if if um ah let's see yeah uh in in the movie logan uh some of the time laura speaks in spanish some of the time she speaks english and that's because she grew up learning both you know, so she is able to act, you know, despite her, her age, she, she, yeah, she speaks both at least well enough that she can act without, like, really struggling with the lines. So I get that. I, I do, but, like, part of the appeal of the first movie was all of these things that are so different, and then in the first sequel... For a huge chunk of it. Like, there's still a little bit of, of Navi spoken. And... Yeah, we see the, the sky people incinerate the forest. And, yeah, uh, the angles and the lightning make the sky people seem monstrous. I quite appreciated that. Um, and yeah, you know, you have this army of... Um, let's see, what are they called again? I honestly forget what they were called in the in the first one. But... And I don't think it said... Amp suit, maybe? Some, something like that. But yeah, the, the... You know, the suits and... 
Yeah. And it goes to black screen. I mean, it was short, but at least it wasn't that bad. Ah, crap. It yeah, then says one year later. And Quaritch is now a recombinant. And, a, you know, several of the other military people are also recombinants. I do really appreciate, because at least one of them is just so much fun. Just so, We love to hate this guy in the first movie. And he did die. He got, like, an arrow to the gut, I want to say. So he definitely, they couldn't bring him back as a human. But, yeah, you know, he is there, not in spirit, but in a different body. And, yeah, I, I quite like that. And Quaritch wants revenge on Jake. And, um, I mean, I guess that's basically the same. Like, yeah, you know, whether this guy is human or blue cat, he wants revenge on Jake Sully. And we see that Jake is actually sort of a military commander of some of the Navi forces, which, yeah, um, that's one of the that's one of the Vietnam. Um, yeah, when, whenever I say the words Vietnam, the bleh, I may or may not have indulged in my sweet tooth when I sat down to watch this movie. So I may or may not be coming off a sugar rush. When each time I say the word Vietnam in this video, unless, unless, unless context clues make it completely clear that it's an exception, then I then what I mean by it is the Vietnam War. But yeah, the you know you you have the you have the the people living in the in the place sabotaging these you know military actions and yeah, there's there's a lot of of Vietnam in in this movie. And the the two boys fly to the train, even though they were specifically ordered not to. And one of them got partially wounded, and Jake takes him back. And he says, you're grounded, no flying for a month. I mean, it took a while. It did. But finally, that sentence, the, the words, you are grounded, actually makes sense. Like, I've never understood how the term grounded refers to you, you have to stay inside your room. But you're grounded, you can't fly? That makes sense. I mean, that has to be how it started, right? Like, some, some Air Force person came home and had to deal with his kids and he was like you are just impossible right now you know what you are grounded and they were like what's that what does that even mean dad ground gr we don't we don't fly you were grounded you heard what i said now you go to your room and you figure out what grounded means and yeah natiri thinks that jake is too hard on their sons, and, you know, at the end of the movie, it is still not resolved. So, yeah, um, I don't think it was necessary to, because, because, like, we are talking two and a half hours after that idea is set up. The movie ends without resolving it. Like, there, I have my issues with the first movie, but at least it did resolve, like, Quaritch is dead, the RDA is leaving the planet, Jake becomes a Na'vi, you know, so it seems like, okay, that's, like, you know, we all knew that somehow 
somehow the RDA was going to return. It's not like the the Navi could do anything. And honestly, like, why couldn't the movie have started with some, like, did Jake legitimately think they just weren't going to come back? Like, I could understand if, if the Navi made something that the humans couldn't, that the Sky People couldn't get past, and then we see, like, some kind of, you know, somehow they, they, the, the sky people, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe the sky people built new technology that would allow them to pick apart the thing that before they couldn't get past. But here it's just like they, they're back. Why were they even gone for so many years anyway? I guess to, for the, for the technology to improve, but they already... They didn't exactly struggle that much before. Yeah, anyway. So, um, there's not a lot in this movie of Sigourney Weaver just playing Grace. But the de-aging is just not, it does not completely work. And I, I yeah, I kind of wish they hadn't gone for it all. Like, I get it. I get it. Obviously, <sighs> the scenes take place during or before the events of the first movie. So, if they just film Sigourney Weaver as she looks today, she would be several years too old for it being this... Oh, I just realized... But I wrote, yeah, I forgot to put the spoiler tag on, but I did say that I was getting into... Well, hopefully you realize by now that I'm talking spoilers. Um, let's see. And... Yeah, and, we, you know, we see that Quaritch and the others pass for Navi, which... Um... Oh, yeah, I was gonna say that wasn't the way it was in the first movie, but yeah, the end of the first movie said that Awa will, um, what was it called again? Um, I forget the exact words, but, I th you know, it was, it was something like that Awa heard, um, there we go. Awa heard Jake's prayer, and, um, let's see, uh, Awa heard Jake's prayer and sent, uh, the, yeah, nature to take out the, the, the humans, and now, you know, we saw the video of, like, yeah, Th that, uh, you know, you, if you just try to fly humans in on the, on the helicopter looking things, then they get attacked. And then the, yeah, Quaritch and the other recombinants can get fast. Yeah. And the teenagers are near... Quaridge. Um, when Jake argues with Natiri and says, we, we have to leave, you know, the Omatakaya, we have to go hide. He says, they came for our children to hurt us. I mean... Like, ultimately, he is right that they would have, but, I mean, they kind of just grabbed, the, you know, the, the Quaritch and, and the other recombinants realized that there were Navi close to them, and then they grabbed them and were happy that it turned out to be the kids of Jake. 
and Neytiri. Um, yeah. Am I remembering it wrong, or did Jake win every single argument with Neytiri? I just, I just feel like it wasn't necessary to... You know, at the end of the day, he is the he's the writer, he's the director. He can make the the white guy that the audience is supposed to empathize most with win all the arguments against the the woman that isn't supposed to be as. But yeah, I don't know. It just felt like it, it feels weird. Like if you watch. The, the two real Terminator movies, like, yeah, some of the time Sarah is wrong, some of the time she's right, you know? It's not that she's just always wrong. Yeah, it kind of, it felt like a, a bitter old man who's like, oh, my wife is so annoying writing and directing those parts. And... Yeah, so this note it out is out of order. I think we're all out of order. But yeah, Jake treats the family like a military squad. And... Yeah, Quaritch grabs the the skull of his former body and, you know, briefly, seriously considers, you know, a, a stage play of Hamlet, but ultimately decides against it and crushes the skull instead. Alas, Poyoric, I threw him well. And... Yeah, Quaritch, you know, loses the rest of the the family, but he does manage to go get Spider away from, yeah. And Spider tries to get out of the cell, and they say he's gone feral. And... Yeah, you know, Jake wants to go and Neytiri wants to stay. Like, why not at least have it be that he wants to go and once she agrees that they go, she suggests where they go. Because as far as I remember and understand, understood from watching the movie, it was also his idea to go to... I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but yeah, the, the Reef people... I appreciate that, you know, the, the mind-reading device that Spider is, is tortured in, that actually does sound like something that would eventually, like, so if I understand correctly, like, basically, they ask him a question, and he doesn't have to say out loud what the answer is. He can just, if, if he just thinks of the answer, they can figure it out through the, the, like, the, what was it she said? Um, just picture it in your mind, and then they can read it. That actually does make some amount of sense, as far as, you know, obviously, truth serum is not completely as simple as the movies and such maybe but but this one is completely you know just diving headfirst into sci-fi because apparently the the that juice that they got from killing whales that can stop human aging so that's yeah we have completely i mean usually he he makes sure that there's a certain... Ah, uh, what's the word? He tends to, to keep it 
fairly credible with the with the science fiction, but yeah. And Quaritch tries appealing to Spider. I like that as they're flying to the reef, you know, um, yeah, I, I think it's the youngest, uh, was maybe Took or something like that. She says, are we there yet? As they're flying there on the dragon. That's, yeah, that's kind of a funny, like, yeah. And, yeah, you know, they arrive at the, uh, at the, at the reef, reef place, you know, and, yeah, uh, there, there's already a number of, you know, sea creatures there, and, uh, you know, let's be honest, Jake can sometimes be quite the dick, so he's adding the sea men, and it adds up to society. And Jake apologizes for Natiri, and we're supposed to be like, those women, they just won't admit when they're wrong. It's just like, what? Did you write this script like 30 years ago? Like, who? How is that still? And at no point, like, okay, it's possible it'll in, in one of the sequels, but I just, I really didn't. I really feel like there needed to be more of, like, yeah, the, the conflict between Neytiri and, I think it was the character played by Kate Winslet, but the, the Reef people, um, met, ah, crap. Yeah, she was the one who healed the, uh... Kiri, maybe? I think it was. Sully's stick together. Now, can I get a Woe Bundy? And they use sign language under the water for communication. That, yeah, that makes sense. I like that we see Quaritch as a father contrasted with Jake as a father. And Loak, um, what is this? What else did I write? Oh, right, right, yeah. His his heart beats faster because the girl he likes is is touching him directly, and I don't know. I was, that wasn't the worst joke in the world. That yeah, and. We see Quaritch try to fly a banshee, and like, I mean, I guess they had to fly banshee because if they flew helicopters, they might get attacked by Awa. Yeah, it just, it kind of felt like, I mean... If you really badly wanted, I guess the, you couldn't have one of the Navi be an antagonist because the, the you know, he's, he's, he still really wants it to be this thing of, you know, um, what's the word? Um... James Cameron really wants the conflict to be between Sky People and Navi, so it can't be Navi fighting each other, even though then you would, then, you know, yeah, then you would have this thing of, you know, some of them fly after the, the, I mean, obviously, I agree that, you know, the problems of the world aren't created by indigenous people, but I mean, I just got done watching um, Luke Cage season two, and of, of there's only two seasons. That one does have African American antagonists, you know, and the 
the first Black Panther movie, the the villain is also an African American. Yeah, you know, also yeah, also a black man. Even though the the hero is also a black man, um. So so yeah, I I don't think it's, you know, at at this point it is possible to walk and chew gum. You can have, the the. You know, it's it's okay to have villains that do. Um, yeah, that look and and act certain ways that used to be just the stereotype. You know, obviously, sadly, there still are people who think that every black man is like Killmonger, uh, you know, or uh, Cornell Stokes or Mariah Dillard, you know. But the yeah, these media properties were made you know, by and for people who can appreciate that just because some members of a minority group do something wrong, that doesn't mean that all the members of the minority group do something wrong, or that the, you know, but, yeah. And we have some scenes with the bullies i quite liked loak fighting the bullies i mean i suppose it it kind of was a little obvious where the thing with the you know okay yeah i have more fingers than you do but you know my hand can do something really interesting you just just watch carefully you do this with it and then you know and then he punches the the other kid like I guess the idea is supposed to be that Navi don't usually do that. That's more of a Sky People thing, and they know it because the uh, can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Jake, you know, sometimes talks about his past as a Sky person. You know, but it was still a bit obvious. But yeah. I, I don't think I'll ever tire of scenes in movies and TV shows and such of bullies getting their comeuppance. And... Yeah, and, and they, they trick Loak to, into going out to where it's... In, in the area that's dangerous. And Loak flees the, the massive sea creature and then... Let's see. I got kind of a, a Terminator vibe from that. I gotta admit, the way it's just no matter where Loak goes, it's still coming at him, and just and and then suddenly he's not sure where it is, but it's close by, and this will, yeah. Uh, I'll take it. I I'm not sure Cameron is gonna direct. Yeah, di direct another Terminator movie, or even write the full script for one anytime soon if ever at all so yeah uh terminator by way of sea creature i guess we should be grateful that there were no flying piranhas and loak is rescued from the sea creature and loak takes the 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 painful thing out of the whales was it Finn? I'm I'm not entirely sure. And they become friends, which is like, isn't there like a an old um, fairy tale about a guy removing a thorn from a lion's paw? I I really got a vibe of of that. I gotta admit. And Loak takes the blame for the chief's son. And... So yeah, you know, Loak finds the unique whale where in the first one Jake found the unique banshee. And... Yeah. You know, this whale is just misunderstood. 
and I really wish I didn't get any Free Willy vibes during it. How did that become a franchise? Like, I get making one movie, but I feel like I heard about a third movie? At least, I don't, I don't think I even want to look up how many there are. Like, I get it, it's, you know... It's surprisingly cute looking for, you know... I forget, was it a killer whale in those movies? I feel like that was what it was. And it's pretty wild that it that they managed to make it look cute, but yeah. Eclipse is the best time of day to be here. I kind of love... Okay, so the implication must be that there's an eclipse every day? Because the... She didn't say the best time of week or month or year or decade or century. She said of day. <laughs> I mean, sure. Cameron, it's your world. You you write the rules. If if you want there to be a <laughs> Yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and we see uh, Kiri, you know, communicating with Grace. Why am I different? Because it's relatable. And... Yeah, you know, she... Kiri has a seizure and is helped by the... the um, I I think it's the Kate Winslet character, and I think this is out of order. But uh, at one point, Quaritch said he wants to scalp Jake. I quite appreciate because that you know it's really frustrating that that's something that is now considered you know like like you have a, a bunch of racists pointing to scalping as evidence that the Native Americans were these, you know, just completely, you know, just, they were, they were just monsters. They, you know, it's, it's a good thing that we, you know, displaced and, and killed, you know, so, so many of them, when in reality it was white people who were scalping, and then Native Americans started doing it as well. Now. And that's also like, because nobody scalped anybody in the first movie, so it's, it's the white guy who brings up that idea, rather than getting it from Natives. And... Yeah, you know, Quaritch is told we don't know which of these hundred villagers Jake is hiding in, so he just says, oh, we'll search them all, and they brutalize the, the people there, kill their animals, and... Let's see... Set fire to their huts, and Spider wants no part of it. And... Yeah, you know, again, the, it really made me think about Vietnam, where that was also something that just, yeah, I, I really, really hope, I think this movie has a chance, and I hope that happens to start a conversation about Vietnam, because there are so many things that in this movie are being done by the villain to people that we have now been you know, like, by the time you see the, the, uh, actually, yeah, I, I don't, I suppose I don't know for sure if it would happen if you didn't watch the first one, but if you watch the first movie and then this movie, certainly by the time you see them setting fire to huts, you prefer the, the Navi people 
to the sky people and yeah it definitely makes you um yeah you know the, the so many of the things that Quaritch do and and his people do to Navi in this movie were done by um uh, done by the American forces against the Vietnamese. And Loek goes inside the whale, and there is like a second where it's like, oh no. Uh, okay, um, is, um, is Pinocchio anywhere nearby? Because we, it would be really good if he could save, uh, yeah. But but yeah, it uh, you know he and and the the thing comes out and he connects with it and he sees the you know what really happened the thing that led this particular whale to be an outcast Payakan I think they call it yeah and the other chief explains. The whole thing with Peya Khan, and we see the the um, uh, Tuluk uh, boating whaling thing, and I I quite like you know one of them is like ah see I told that would happen you owe me a beer you know they're like they're so desensitized to the fact that they're like they're killing living creatures that are in no way threatening them. You know, it's in in the first movie you had Quaritch drinking coffee while they were bombing the trees, and yeah, Spider learns how you know smart the whales are, and we're introduced to a new unobtainium inside the whales, and let's. See. Yeah, Spider asks, you know, do you just, um, what does that say, discard, I think, the rest, you know, so, like, the buffalo, where, yeah. Um... Yeah, and, and, you know, when the, um, I actually don't remember the circumstances, um, yeah, I think it's that some of the, the, th that's right, they killed, um, the, the specific Tulukun for the, um, K uh, Kate Winslet character. And she says twice, what is this? Well, I, I think it's called the, the hero reaches his lowest end. It's honestly, it's a very common storytelling. Um, yeah. And they discuss what to do. And don't worry, the white guy who is now an outsider twice over gets to, you know... Like, I get it. I get that a lot of movies made, although, you know, he's Canadian, he's not American, but made for Americans, you know, they, they, they're they afraid people will be confused and angry if it's not just the white guy who gets, you know, who's, who's right every single time, but I really don't think it was necessary to do here. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know if James Cameron has been paying attention to where, like, today you have movies. You know, you, you we have, movies are being made, movies and shows and such, that have a more nuanced view. It doesn't have to be the, the yeah. And Loak wants to warn Payakan because nobody else is going to because he's an outcast. And I do quite appreciate, you know, Payakan is actually the one 
Like, if Loak hadn't befriended Peya Khan, um, Peya Khan wouldn't have been able to to help as much as he, she, they do in the in the climax. And that that really is very very cool. The Pe Peyakan like leaping over, you know, the the boat, and like, yeah, I think yeah, leaping up and then just falling on just, yeah, that little. <laughs> well, he didn't make it, and he crushed her boy. And we have a lot of Navi on banshees, although. You know, ultimately, Jake is the only one, because hostages and such. And, yeah, so this is out of order, but earlier we were told that Tulkun are actually smarter than Sky People. And... Yeah, the... So I already, again, out of order, but I, I just wanted to note... I think they called it Ambrian, that's, you know, inside the, the whale's brain, and it stops human aging. And I don't think it's accidental that, like, you know, so, so James Cameron is basically saying they would rather, they're, they're willing to kill creatures that don't look human, but they're actually as smart as human beings are so that human beings can live longer like can just it's you know they're not they're not solving some problem you know this is not the cure for cancer it's the cure for aging like that's just you know aging happens it happens to every living creature you know why it's, it's not, you know, we're not, we don't have some kind of huge problem where, you know, like, you know, uh, let's, yeah, let's say that we lived in, uh, let's see, what's it called again? There's this, um, ah. Uh, I, ah, crap. I forget what it's called, but there's this, um, this fictitious thing where, oh, I think it's called Logan's Run. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna double check. Logan's Run. So, yeah, the, the novel depicts a dystopic Malthusianism future society in which both population and the consumption of resources are maintained in equilibrium by requiring the death of everyone reaching the age of 21. And, yeah, you know, obviously, if we lived in that society, then something that stopped aging would change everything that would be a huge but we're not dealing with a situation that's not at all the situation we're in the fact that human beings age you know that's just a fact of life you know obviously like i think probably pretty much everyone no matter how hard you work to avoid it you probably you know realize at some point oh i would i uh, i should have done that back when I was younger, you know, but that's, there's always going to be things like that, no matter what, you know, uh, yeah, again, let's hypothetically say that what they found was the cure for cancer, that, you know, an argument could be made, that, that that's at least an ethical discussion that could be had, but they want to kill these creatures that compose music and are just, you know, look, just, you don't have to listen to it. You can just, you know, nobody's forcing you to listen to it. There are easier ways to get out of listening to music you don't want to listen to than, than killing composers. But the, yeah, you know, these incredibly intelligent beings 
but they don't look like humans so yeah they're willing to kill them so that we can basically live longer and i guess possibly forever you know i've i've long held the opinion that it would not be a, a good thing for us to to live forever i think life has meaning life has the meaning that we give it specifically because life eventually ends things that don't end are basically meaningless you know we appreciate things by the fact that eventually there's no more eventually it changes into something else uh let's see the so so yeah i i thought that was a, a good metaphor that you know yeah, Cameron is pointing out, you know, they don't they don't need it. The sky people don't need this thing, but they are willing to yeah. Uh let's see. And Took gets uh you know, she, she gets out of the water and then we get another horror movie music sting. Absolutely love it. And they get caught in a net. To the railing, and yeah, Payakan attacks Quaritch and the other recombinants, and Kiri attacks uh, you know the the submariners using the the um, Awa connection. That you know, yeah, I I quite like that. And spider sabotages, and you know it's it's quite effective. And basically, spider, you know, it's almost too obvious when they like. At one point, like Quaritch literally says to him, "You're gonna be our interpreter," and it's like, get it, audience? Like how in you know Vietnam, Americans would get some of the Vietnamese to translate and some of these maybe also did some sabotage of the american military hardware so it's just yeah but it's it's fun to see no, nevertheless i really like when jermaine clement went who's got the harpoon now i i gotta admit i didn't see that one coming i did not realize that that because and it's such a great, because that is, like, I I forget, I'm not sure if it's, like, a historical, like, you, you could definitely see how some some historical, you know, could, could have said, but it definitely, like, yeah, maybe it is only movie characters, but I've heard the, the that said before, you know, well, I'm the one with the bigger weapon, so... That's why I'm the one who gets to be in charge. Something like that, you know. And, yeah, it's... <laughs> Payakan totally turned the, the harpoon on the other guy. Yeah. And... Let's see. I swear this movie shows... Shots of the Eclipse more frequently than Heroes did. And... Let's see. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Jake calms down Neytiri, who's being this emotional woman, and it just... I... I really don't understand where the why Cameron is suddenly writing stuff like this. He used to have there used to be so much empathy for for women in his movies and just yeah. Uh let's see. Yeah, so Jake and Natiri together attack Quaridge and the other military people and apparently one of Quaridge's men is named Prager. Any relation to Dennis Prager of Prager U? Because that, I could definitely see that that guy would 100% try to colonize uh, another planet if he 
had the chance. So yeah, there's some chance that that's an actual intentional reference. And let's see. Hmm. Yeah, um, Jake and Quaridge fight on the sinking ship. And some underwater fighting between the two, which was kind of cool. And yeah, I got to say, the last chunk of the climax kind of felt like um, Titanic, but now there's also, like, fighting scenes, aliens, and, you know, yeah. It just, it felt like, like, dude, you just, you, you already made that movie. Like, I get missing it. Um, I've, I still, like, like I said, I think it's one of his best. Um, but, yeah. Let's see. And, yeah, and Spider saves Quaridge for some reason. And... Jake tells Loak to go without him, and Loak teaches Jake the, the breathing method, which, I mean, yeah. Um, I remember being young and, like, intently memorizing the thing that my crush was trying to teach me as a, you know, and, and being able to, like, verbatim reproduce the the lesson yeah did i say i remember being young i i meant i remember being a teenager i still am young let's see and Um, yeah, and so the movie ends with the, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, they bury the, the oldest son, and become part of the, the reef people, and after an entire movie where Jake was certain that the solution was to you know, get away from the where, where he used to be to to keep them safe. Oh, okay, now we're just gonna stay put, which makes me wonder how the third movie is also going to be about him and other blue people having to learn a completely different. Yeah, I seriously hope that they that it that the third movie is not about blue people learning you know, the culture of other blue people. Now, that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So... So yeah, honestly, like, I was almost surprised that Michelle Rodriguez didn't come back. Like, she was brought back from the dead in the Fast and the Furious and Resident Evil franchises. And this one did not bring back, at least not in this movie. Um, I mean, she's... I don't really understand. Some people seem to not like her. I, I totally, like, some of the, um, some of the things she said, apparently she is one of the people who thinks that, you know, yeah, diversity in characters is good, but you should create new characters and make them diverse instead of recontextualizing already existing characters, which I completely disagree with, but, 
yeah, like, she's always really badass, she's always charming, and, like, well, maybe not, maybe not charming, but, like, cool, like, you, you wanna, and, and she has some really excellent lines in the first movie as well, and, yeah, I would, I would be very interested to see her return in, in some way, although I realize, you know, the reason that Sigourney Weaver is back is because she became part of Awa. Um, the the you know Grace died as they were trying to transfer her into a an avatar body. But yeah. Now let's see. And yeah. So I uh, let's see. That's right. The the um, depending on when you ask him, the exactly how many movies. Yeah. So for a while, he said that they were gonna, you know, certainly. It used to be that Cameron said that he was gonna make a new trilogy of Avatar movies, and. Yeah, you know, if even one of these fail, like, they might lose hundreds of millions, his career as a director may be over. I really hope that doesn't happen, but, like, I don't know if he's doing enough, if he's paying enough attention to trends. Like, Avatar 1 was mired in tropes that were wildly out of date, some of them downright unacceptable by 2009, you know, he's still in charge, at least partially in charge, of the scripts for for these movies. And, yeah, if if not, um, let's see. I don't think it's wise to plan so many sequels before even a single sequel has come out. If people lose interest before he's released all of them, the money sunk into the upcoming ones could be completely wasted. And... You know, yeah, we will really need to deliver something amazing with even the first of these sequels. Keeping in mind, he think he seemed to think Terminators 5 and 6 would do well and talked up Alita Battle Angel, and all three of those movies failed. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, it's it's okay if you like them. I, I certainly do think that there's something good about all three of those movies, but, like, as far as I understand, all of them lost at least some money or... Failing that they maybe made the money they had to, but they weren't popular enough that more were made, you know. Uh, I forget about the third one, but Terminators 4, 5, and 6, all three were supposed to start a new trilogy, and all three of them, you know, were so negatively or mixed in reception that the you know, the plans for a trilogy were completely thrown out the window. Let's see. And, yeah, if the... Yeah, so currently Avatar 5 is slated for a 2028 release, which means that someone who had just been born when the first came out in 2009 will be old enough to vote by the time that one comes out. And, let's see, yeah, you know, um, let's see, there are other movie series where there have been, like, really long, you know, breaks in between, you know, uh, recently a new Top Gun movie came out, and, you know, the first one is from, like, 86, you know, so, but I, I, I'm I not sure that there has been this long of a delay where the sequels had been planned, like, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% certain if he had already planned to make more than one when he made the first one, but certainly it wasn't very long before he started talking about, you know, yeah, multiple sequels. And I think the original plan was to release 
the second movie in 2014 and then you know because of the technology not existing he had to postpone but yeah um let's see and yeah like even like with with uh, with Star Wars George Lucas wasn't originally going to make more than the first 3 you know there were years where he wasn't going to make more Star Wars movies. Uh, let's see. You know, back when I thought that I wouldn't like this movie, I was going to open the video by calling the movie Avatar Too Long Between Movies to Expect People to Care. And, yeah, to briefly talk about some of the things that bothered me the most about the first movie... Jake Sully started as a disabled man who gave up on everything but then got the use of his legs because disabled people get their disability used as a tool for screenwriters. You know, the easy to relate to white guy who went from not understanding the Navi tribe at all to being unchallenged as the leader of an entire tribe. Let's see. And yeah, you know, the now... Jake has had children with Neytiri, and they have an adopted human son, so that the white male audience don't have to empathize only with people who look different from us. Keeping in mind that so far, you know, we now have two Avatar movies, and both of them have a major character who is a white guy trying to sort of fit in with the Na'vi. Like, I just... I really, really hope, yeah, yeah, and he, you know, the character's still there by the end of this movie, so he'll be there, I, I'd be very surprised if he wasn't also in at least the third movie, I just, I really, if you don't ask people to empathize with people outside of their in-group, then they're, you know, a number of people just aren't going to, and, and it's, we, we really have a huge problem, you know, this was a man who, when, when he made the second Terminator movie, he had, you know, Sarah Connor, like, ramble on about how, you know, I've talked at length about this in other videos, but just, you know, Sarah Connor apparently thinks that, you know... This video is already so long. Um, I'm talking about the time where she talks to a specific character and talks about, you know, what it's like to create life, feel life growing inside of you. You know, clearly James Cameron feels that there are certain things that we do that we need to do different or stop doing entirely and I really think I, I really hope that at some point he recognizes that one of the biggest problems today is getting a mainstream audience to a, to empathize with someone you know yeah someone who isn't a straight white cis man and just, I'm, I'm not, there, there are a lot of mainstream audiences who are willing to do that, but there are also a chunk who refuse to, and it's just, yeah, I hope he, he, anyway, now, don't get me wrong, interracial adoption is an important issue to educate people on, but I can't help but notice, of all the ethnicities they could have gone with, is, you know, they go with a white guy, and this is, like, I, I googled it earlier, according to his own Instagram, he is, the, the actor portraying Spider is white, and he's running around with dreadlocks, tribal tattoos. These days, a lot of conservatives reject out of hand media that asks them to empathize with people other than white men. We really need to band together and make sure there is no media that only centers white men, so that their choices are avoid all media, or... Except media that doesn't only center white men. Begrudgingly, certainly at first, sure, but it's just, yeah. 
So, you could easily have the character of Jake, Navi, from the start of the first movie, and you wouldn't have the white savior narrative, which is a big part of the problem with the first movie. Just, if you still wanted him to be isolated and different from the Omatikaya tribe, have him be the lone survivor of another tribe. And if you're still dead set on him lying to Neytiri, though I really think that was a bad idea, have it be that he knew the humans were going to target Home Tree and the Omatakaya, maybe he interrogated the human that got separated, and not tell the Omatakaya because he hopes to get another shot at killing the humans for revenge, and then he realizes he won't be able to do it alone and comes clean. And before you say, oh, they must just not have thought of the idea of the protagonist being a Navi lone survivor, that is the core setup for the tie-in game that came out, like, I, I believe the same year as the first film. And, like, immediate, the, the moment that I started playing it and found out that I'm going to be playing as a an actual Navi, not a human avatar, I, I was like, why, why didn't they make the movie about that? That's just, yeah. Now, uh, let's see. Right, so according to, like, interview, apparently the script for Avatar 4 is completely crazy, which me we maybe won't get if 2 and 3 don't do well enough. Maybe that script should be for Avatar 2 or even Avatar 1. I mean, obviously, possibly needing rewriting, but why wait so long for the one that might make an impression? And let's see... So yeah, in Avatar 1, narration is basically a filmmaking shortcut. Like, I'm still not sure why it even appears in the movie after Jake is no longer on the mission recording vlogs. Like, I, I get it. By the very end, they, you know, they do acknowledge it one more time that he's like, well, I guess this is the last of these vlogs. And I'm still like, why were you still recording them after the mission? Like... Did he just get so into that habit that he just couldn't get back out of that habit? Like, I don't know. It just feels... Yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, in the first movie, Jake gets way more moments where he's cool as an avatar than any of the Na'vi who have been Na'vi their whole lives. In this one, a number of the, the cool Na'vi moments go to people who were always Na'vi. Or at the very least, like, children of Avatar and Na'vi. Uh, um, right, so, yeah. Um, if, you, if you pay attention to James Cameron's interviews... Be careful, or you'll, like, he drops this major spoiler for the villain identities of the the sequels beyond this one, which I don't even know why you would, yeah. In the first movie, Neytiri forgives Jake for the betrayal, the lie that the entire relationship is based on, in very little time with almost no reason. In fact, she apologizes to him. I'm, I'm not, I, I forget, he might also try to apologize to her, but it's still, like, I, I don't, let's be honest, you should not forgive someone who does that, and, and it's just, there are so many men who continue to think that it's okay to lie to women as a matter of course because they want to, they want a certain situation for them, and it's just, it's so despicable. I really... We we have to stop making movies that act like it's at all acceptable. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful that today we... You know, there are movies getting made where 
when it's revealed that a man is lying to a woman and, a, you know, maybe a threat to her, the movie is no longer interested in trying to redeem him. It just, it acknowledges, no, that's it. He's, you know, he betrayed your trust, he lied to you, and or he's dangerous. That's it. You At this point, you figure out how to get away from him and back to safety. That's what you do. You don't try to talk him, you know, to, to convince him to be a human being because he had that chance already. I could really respect if this movie had pulled a Matrix sequels and go in a completely different direction than anyone expected, but yeah, I maybe Avatar 4 is that. Now, yeah, so both of these Avatar movies, and very likely the following sequels, have this slightly awkward identity where they both embrace nature, but also this cowboy attitude with big guns and solving major problems with violence. I'm not saying that it would make very much sense for the movies as written to not have action, you know, but, and, and we kind of expect, you know, guns and action and explosions from James Cameron, but these are still two perspectives that don't usually go together. They're usually in conflict with one another. A love of nature is inherently about creation and life, not only human life and guns, explosions and such, let's face it, are known to protect life other than human life. Let's see, and... Um, right, so, yeah, and I actually, you know, you don't... In case you're already in the comment section, I have an example. Silent Running is an environmentalist movie without guns and explosions. You know, it makes sense for James Cameron to end movies with killer robots, spies and such with guns and explosions, but maybe not environmentalist ones. Honestly, I think it would, you know, for both of these movies, it would have made more sense if the ending was, like, dramatic but more fitting, you know, so somewhat similar to Titanic. You know, that also doesn't have guns as well. It has at least one gun, but it doesn't, it's not, like, people gunning each other down and such. And it's still a really gripping, you know, ending to, to that movie, and I, I could also really respect if, you know, I guess maybe one of these sequels will, but so far, two Avatar movies, both of them have ha happy endings for the, the heroes, you know, and I mean, in the first one, at least they did get rid of the sky people, they, they, you know, but then they just, they're just back here, and then in this movie, the movie ends without them actually being taken care of. Like, Quaritch isn't even dead, although I suppose maybe... Like, I'm, I'm not sure anybody other than Spider knows that, but didn't he reject Quaritch near the end? I mean, isn't he just going to go to... Actually, I suppose it's possible he won't just go directly to... Since Neytiri did try to, to stab him. Yeah. Uh, uh, cut him. And she did cut him at least once, but, yeah. Um, let's see. And I also, I, I wonder, you know, did Avatar 1 make people who wouldn't already empathize with the indigenous people protesting the, the pipeline? You know, maybe movies like, maybe, yeah, maybe this one will do better, but maybe movies like this don't lead to increased empathy. Maybe it just makes the people who don't already empathize with indigenous people think they just need a white savior to teach them how to be better indigenous people. And there we go. Right, so, yeah, in the, in the first movie, on multiple occasions, especially early in the film, Jake is criticized by others for not already knowing very much of the p culture of Pandora. I get why it's frustrating for him, but at the end of the day, he did agree to this job. When he did that, he basically implicitly agreed that he could do the job. And here are some people who do not believe he can. And instead of just 
responding that he'll do his best, he arrogantly responds with harsh comments himself. He even does this to some of the natives, you know, that he is literally specifically there to displace. It would be one thing if he eventually had to make amends for this behavior, and I do acknowledge that he does eventually stop doing it, and obviously, early on, it's in character for him to behave like that, but it's one of countless cases where the white male lead character in an American movie is not made to apologize for doing the wrong thing. Like, basically, he becomes Turuk Makto, and that's it. There's nothing else. I, I think it's too bad that this movie doesn't explore Quaritch being made up of memories and in a new body that much. I'm sure Philip K. Dick is spinning in his grave. But yeah, you know, he's still alive by the end of this movie. Maybe they'll do it in one of the next. Because I really do think that there's something, there's something incredibly fascinating they can do there. Um, so, so yeah. And, yeah, so I mentioned, you know, stuff that um, that the, um, some of the characters in this, some of the, some of the female characters in this do that is um, stuff that's thought of as feminine rather than masculine. Kate Winslet, I think, character healing Kiri and Kiri connecting with Awa to, to grab submarines, you know, these are things that you know, um, female intuition and the, the sort of the healing, you know, and ultimately, you know, a lot of that is down to the, the kind of, uh, what's the word, how we, you know, it's, it's a, it's, uh, so social construct and such. But if you, you know, if you're going to insist that that, no. Oh, you know, men do one, th you know, do this thing, women do this other thing. You know, these are some positive examples of things that women do that, uh, yeah, are thought of as feminine. So one critic pointed out, at the time this is set, Earth is so damaged that humanity is now looking for a new planet to live on. And they've s settled on Pandora, even though this is a planet with outbreathable oxygen and full of dangerous animals and humanoid life life so apparently this was the idea of elon musk which is very relevant we got to keep criticizing him until he stops being idolized by so many people he just wasted so much money buying twitter because he he missed that the babylon bee could you know who were all you know that they're simping for him and let's see so yeah um so one one critic pointed out if they can bring back humans in avatar bodies with their memories intact why didn't they do that with tom sully instead of getting jake to replace him and yeah, like I, I don't think Cameron knew that he wanted Quaritch back, or he would have, you know, had had some other kind of yeah, because because it really is like, I mean, maybe you could say, oh well, you know, the technology wasn't there. You know, and they didn't want to wait until the technology was developed, but it's just, yeah. Wait, does that mean that when they, in the at the end of the first movie, when they sent all the RDA people off-world, did they not check to make sure... That, like, yeah, something like that, like a, a full, like, a, all of their memories stored in some, like, um, didn't they still, they still had people who were involved in at least some of the base stuff. Yeah. Um. Anyway, um. So. 
So that is it for. So yeah, you know, I'm I'm hopeful and cautiously optimistic for the the next sequels. I really, really hope that. Um, I I don't think. many story threads that it doesn't follow through on that we don't get a, a conclusion to then I, I I don't think it's I I don't like the idea of of so much like and before we bring up like you know Lord of the Rings the two towers that one does still get at least some things you know, cleared out by the end of that movie that, uh, and it also, with that one, we knew that there would only be three movies. If there's supposed to be five total, this is only two, does that mean that movies three and four are also not going to completely conclude the, like, yeah, I just, I, I, but at the end of the day, like, um, James Cameron, don't know how he does it, but he does still manage to impress and, and deliver something each time, but yeah, so, hit me up in the comments, let me know what is your favorite James Cameron movie, do you think certain things about certain things in this movie should have been handled differently than what the yeah than how they were handled and yeah if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell like it's working for the RDA and happy to brutalize intelligent life forms just to stop aging of Sky People, uh, there should be a link to my main channel page. One two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most, uh, yeah, one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.